Okay, we'll kick off here. Uh, for now, there might be a few people joining, uh, but I'd just like to welcome everyone to the second module in our professional development series. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I currently am, which are the Gadigal people and their elders past, present and emerging. We aim to respect them, their history and their future by respecting and maintaining this land that supports us. In this series uh, on improving mathematics outcomes, we're working on four pedagogical philosophies to move the needle in student learning. All of these are grounded in data-driven practices and equipping to equip teachers and empower students. They've been designed so that each topic is discrete and you don't need one to make sense of the other, but obviously there'll be value in attending all four. The next session will be on how teachers can create uh, the foundation for positive mindsets to boost educational engagement. And the last session will look at inclusivity and equitable learning in the classroom. While there will be elements of math space in this series, uh, the focus will be on the pedagogical ideas coming through them. So if you'd like to interact throughout this session, uh, please make sure that you present to all panellists and attendees so that everyone can uh, see your ideas and inputs. If you have a question for Alex throughout the session, please use the Q&A button and we'll come to that when there's an appropriate uh, moment uh, to do so. Uh, so with that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Alex Abunt, who is an experienced maths and physics teacher in Queensland, and he's taught across both the public and private sectors for nearly 10 years. After seeing the benefits of MathSpace in his classroom and generally being impressed by MathSpace, uh, the MathSpace philosophy, he now enjoys working with schools seeking to use technology meaningfully and working with MathSpace to do so. Yeah, thanks so much, Erin. Um, it's really nice to be here. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming along this afternoon to participate in the discussion. Um, I can see some people are still joining, which is, which is great. I've been really looking forward to exploring the application of mastery learning with you. And I hope that you can draw some really practical uh, concepts from this presentation. Um, and I do have some questions that I'm going to ask throughout the presentation. So please do use the chat function within Zoom um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to hearing, hearing from you there. At any time, if you do have a question, please feel free to ask it um, even as I'm presenting as well. And i and, um, happy to have a conversation there if appropriate. Uh, basically, the, the learning objectives for this session is that I want to sort of look at the concept of mastery oriented learning as, as a whole. So what is it? Uh, I do want to sort of go and have a little look at some past attempts. So there'll be a little bit of a, a sort of mini history lesson in here definitely spend some time on ideas and tools for implementation and, and I want to keep it really practical as well. So um, just looking at some practical applications for the classroom and uh, the mastery oriented mindset. And now in, in the true sort of mastery orientation sort of concept, um, I, I know that people will be at different levels in terms of how they're sort of coming to this session. Uh, some people might just be ready to consider what it is and sort of learn a little bit more. Other people might want to completely redefine their classroom. Uh, no matter where you sit on this scale and, and even myself, like I wouldn't consider myself a master of this. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to actually run a mastery oriented classroom, but I think there's a huge amount of value to be gained from it. So wherever you sit uh, on this scale, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll get something really useful out of this session. And, uh, and I'm really hoping that, uh, yeah, it's gonna change some of the, the thoughts and the, the way that you think about education um, in a practical way. And uh, so yeah, without any further ado, let's get in. I wanna start with dis this, the discussion by drawing some stimulus from the vision statement uh, at MathSpace. This is part of what impressed me um, by, about the company. So it certainly resonates with me, this statement, and it's part of why I joined the team. And when I wasn't swamped by some of the more administrative demands of teaching, I would like to think that I provided an opportunity for every student in my class uh, to excel in all of my classes, um, at least some of the time. 
And so the idea that every student is capable of learning mathematics is what drove the founders of MathSpace to create an adaptive digital learning resource 10 years ago. Um, it's noticeably shaped every feature in the platform today. It's also the principle that directed people such as Sal Khan in his work with Khan Academy and was the foundation of Benjamin Bloom's philosophy when he published his thoughts on learning for mastery back in 1968. Uh, but we'll get into the history a little bit more in a moment. So I really want to focus in on this statement, though, on the concept of excelling at mathematics. And so the first question that I'm going to ask you all is, is what does it mean to excel? Or to put it another way, what does success look like for students in your class? Um, really interested to hear your responses. So if you could uh, put in your answers into the chat and um, yeah, what does it mean for a student to excel in mathematics generally, maybe in your class or even more sort of philosophically, if you like, um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts. And I'm just gonna get the chat up here. Remember to select all panelists so that we can share your thoughts with everyone. Oh, that's panelists, all panelists and attendees. All panelists and attendees, that's right. Sorry, all panelists and attendees. You just need to select the drop down there. So students do their best no matter their skill level. That's good. Um, perhaps some other things that you might be looking at is the ability for students to um, progress through the content at the most basic level. Um, a lot of the time, I feel like it can be tied to grades. Um, to be able to understand concepts and transfer ideas, that's excellent. I love that. So sort of being able to bring together multiple concepts. Uh, I think that that's really the direction we're going with 21st century learning, of course. Um, so yeah, that's really good. Any other thoughts? I think it's worth pondering this. Um, I certainly don't think that I pondered it enough because I sort of got caught up in just the day-to-day -day sort of coming in, teaching the lessons and, and moving on. So I think it's really worth having a think. Um, so let's progress on and, and talk about sort of my experience and some of my reflections, some of the things that I have been thinking about. I am um, in my in the last sort of so eight years, certainly, um, I have been thinking a lot about the education system. And first of all, I, I've come to the realization that it seems obvious, but tests are designed with a variable achievement level in mind. Um, this is something that's very clear to me in terms of assessment design. Uh, we expect most students to get around a C. Uh, the top students will get an A, there'll be a few students getting a D, and there's sort of this distribution of students that is expected generally in, in assessment design. Uh, this was something that I saw in terms of when I was writing exams and in terms of being reviewed and peer reviewed by other teachers. Uh, it's something that, that everyone was looking for was that ability to really stretch the top level kids and also the ability for some of the bottom level kids to sort of assess or access some of the questions, but that wouldn't necessarily um, be a passing level. So that was sort of something, especially under the previous senior assessment um, regime that, it, that was a part of the system. And, uh, and another sort of slightly more pessimistic um, look at it is, uh, I've sort of got the sense that students are largely expected to remain in one achievement bracket. Uh, now, I, I don't know if other people sort of agree with me on this, um, if that's still the feeling, but it's just this sense that if students had done well in the past, we would expect them to continue to do well. And if students were not doing well, um, often it would be sort of go and look at their previous results. And if they were failing previously, then it's sort of not really a big surprise that they're continuing to fail perhaps. Uh, and so this sort of fixed mindset of, of how things work, it was, uh, yeah, it is depressing. And, and I don't think that any teacher goes into the job like that. Um, and, and obviously, you know, schools, teachers in general, celebrate the successes, celebrate when students do move up um, in their achievement levels. But, um, but it certainly was something that I, I sort of realised was under, underlying in the system. And ultimately, I think it's tied to this idea of performance oriented learning. Um, everything is based on performance and, and measured 
uh, by assessment in terms of summative assessment and grades. And, and I think that that is something very prevalent in our system, unfortunately. And so um, these are symptoms of a fixed mindset, ultimately, and fixed mindsets are products of performance-oriented learning frameworks. But the antithesis of performance-oriented learning is mastery-oriented learning, um, which promotes a growth mindset approach. So the more that I looked at mastery learning, the, the more I sort of thought it had a lot of value. So uh, again, please feel free to write something in the chat now. I'm interested um, in the people that are attending, what do you know about mastery oriented learning uh, at the moment? What are you coming to this session with? Um, do you know a lot about it? Do you know a little about it? Uh, what sort of things do you know about it? I'd be interested to hear from you. It's, um, for, as you're typing, I'll sort of just comment myself. It's something that I, certainly didn't know in terms of the, the name, um, I didn't know a lot of it about it, but the, the idea that students could build on a firm foundation was something that made a lot of sense to me when I, when I started to explore this concept. And there's a lot of challenges that go along with the full concept of mastery learning. Um, I don't know if people are aware of them, but, um, yeah, maybe maybe you don't know anything. If if you if you're brand new to the idea, please feel free to just type brand new or don't currently know a lot in the chat, just so I have an idea of who is coming. Brand new, awesome. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, cool. All right, so. That's, um, that's really good, actually. So um, basically, at the moment in the session, we've got people that, that aren't sort of super familiar with this idea. Um, you can see in the picture there, it's, it's a picture of someone doing um, one of the martial arts. I couldn't tell you which one, um, black belt. This is the typical sort of image of mastery learning. If you can think of day-to-day um, -day general sort of things out there, learning an instrument or doing a martial art, um, it's all about, generally speaking, achieving at a certain level before you progress on to the next. And so that is not how education works. That is not what we're currently doing. Um, typically, if students don't succeed, they get a D, they still move up to the next level and we keep them sort of grouped and, and continue to move them that way. So um, there's a really good analogy that I heard about mastery learning in terms of building a house. And if you were to build a house and um, approach it in the same way that the education system tends to, and, and this is actually one of Sal Khan's illustrations when he's describing the process, then you would probably get all the contractors in, you would tell them to lay the foundation. And then after some time, maybe two weeks, you'd get the inspector in. And if it wasn't up to code, the inspector might say, you know, that's not up to code there. The cement's still a bit wet there. That's okay, I'll give it 80%. Let's build the next floor. And if we continue to go that way and we didn't sort of expect 100% out of each level of when building a house or something like this, it's no surprise that the house would probably fall down. And so um, generally day to day in life, we see a lot of uh, these concepts that are more linked to mastery learning. Um, here's a little bit of a, a comparison for you in terms of the sort of contrast between mastery and performance oriented learning. Um, so really mastery learning is about understanding, mastering, increasing competence. Um, it's about always being challenged and, and having that challenge level just slightly beyond uh, where you're currently at and sort of striving for the next thing and learning the next thing. Um, you can sort of see in this table and get a sense of the uh, negative connotations of performance oriented learning versus the, the more positive framing of, of mastery learning. Um, but typically when we don't allow students the time and space to master a concept and we sort of keep pushing them through a system. Uh, it does end up with this sort of anxiety and, and fear of how they might look, that they're looking dumb, um, or students might think that they're doing better. And so it, it all becomes a very comparative thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of, I guess, a little bit about the concept of mastery learning. Um, I'm glad, I hope that this is interesting to people that uh, haven't thought about this before. 
Um, but yeah, here's, here's the little history, history lesson. So there is a common saying that those that do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, so I'd like to spend a short time looking at the history of education or, or more specifically mastery learning. It probably stems from my mother as well, actually, who insisted that I would be uneducated if I did not study modern history in high school, regardless of my objections. Uh, so as a result, though, um, on the positive side, I'd like to think that I have a healthy appreciation for, for learning from history. And so there's some interesting things um, in the development of mastery learning. I'll keep this quick. Um, 1949, Ralph Tyler, he came along and, and wrote a paper, The Basic Principles of Curriculum and Instruction. So he basically looked at four principles. Um, it was defining appropriate learning objectives, which we all do now with learning goals and success criteria, very common. Um, establishing useful learning experiences, sounds great. Organizing learning experiences to have a maximum cumulative effect. So again, that's very positive and evaluating the curriculum and revising those aspects that did not prove to be effective. So this all sounds great, um, but broadly speaking, these objectives were more on focused on the building blocks of curriculum than it was on the actual in-class practice. Like it was very sort of broad, big picture, um, which I think is important. Um, and then in 1968, Bloom, who was actually a student of Tyler's, he, he published the idea of, of learning for mastery. And his big concept was that there was a big disparity between one-to-one -one tuition and group tuition and uh, in terms of the effectiveness of learning. And so what are some elements from one-to-one -one tuition that we can sort of carry, carry across? Um, he defined the, the concept of formative assessment as we sort of know it today. And so a lot of the work that Benjamin Bloom did, I think has um, had quite a big impact on education. Um, but 10 years later, uh, this idea of outcomes-based education came along. Now, it was very, very short-lived in Australia, um, certainly in Queensland. I think Western Australia held out for a little bit longer, uh, but it was around very briefly and, and phased out um, quite as quickly as it came in um, in, in our country. And uh, the reasons for that, I think, was that it focused primarily, again, on curriculum and assessment and not so much on teaching strategies and I think a big thing that was possibly missing um, was mindset. And so going into back to Bloom, um, a little bit later back in, in 1984, uh, Bloom authored a seminal paper called The Two Sigma Problem. So he came back into the fold and he wanted to search for methods of group instruction as effective as one-to-one -one tutoring. Um, he actually presented findings that one-to-one -one tutoring followed by regular tests and feedback resulted in an average um, student performing two standard deviations better and above the average of the control class. That's a 98% um, outperformance. Um, he believed this was largely due to the constant feedback and corrective processes that students in the mastery learning and tutoring groups were exposed to. Uh, and, and in fact, um, that is again part of what led to the idea of formative assessment that we understand today. So I have no doubt that his work had an effect on current educational practices in some sense with additional significant work done by others, of course. But I think this question of why mastery learning is not more prevalent is very interesting to me. Uh, with some research, you'll actually find criticisms of the 1984 study and the fact that a similar effect size has not been recently reproduced, um, least of all in Australia. However, I would like to think that we're measuring from a significantly altered baseline due to the formative assessment practices and, and other things that have been adopted and are now prevalent in the education system. Um, so I, th I think that that's part of why mastery learning hasn't sort of taken hold is, is it's focused on only very small elements of the idea, but Bloom's thinking actually went far beyond formative assessment and feedback strategies. Um, he proposed a framework in which teachers and students have flexibility to work at a pace necessary to master the current topic or, or concept as determined by a specific threshold on a project or exam, often around 80%. So and this is a, a massive idea. Um, and in line with the late Sir Ken Robinson's views from his talk on changing education paradigms, which you may have seen, uh, the education system in schools are actually made in the image of industrialization, so Sir, Sir Ken would say, uh, from which they came. Students sent through this system in batches by age group sort of 
implies that the most important thing is their date of manufacture. And, uh, and of course that sort of sounds absurd, but that is, um, I guess the way that we, we sort of approach the education system more broadly. And so um, I, I wanted to find some examples. There's not a large number of examples of mastery learning being used locally. I'm, we're starting to see some schools sort of do a bit of a stage not age approach, uh, but I wanted to look for some testimonials on the concept. And there's actually a number of proponents for mastery learning in the US. Um, probably due to COVID, I think has sort of spurred this on and people are saying, rather than going back to the system the way it was, we should um, move forward. And so I found this, this is Tom Driscoll, he's a teacher in Rhode Island uh, and they're employing a, a mastery learning concept there. So I, I was interested to see what students themselves would say. Um, so I'm just gonna play this video and, uh, and we'll get, get a bit of a summary of how students perceive this concept. The advantages of mastery learning, like you can go more in depth in like the subject. Um, go at like my own pace, so I don't have to worry about like falling behind. So I actually have time to go through the subject and actually learn it. I feel like the parts of the class that help me most are self-pacing because some people get ahead and some people fall behind. And this way I can work at my own pace without getting rushed. Advantages of mastery learning are you can take your time and if you're behind, the teacher will talk to you to see what you can do to catch up. I like the fact that um, you kind of move at your own pace. So say you're like, you're more of a fast paced learner, you can just keep going and like just breeze through it. But if you're a slower paced learner, then you can take your time and like do your work at your own. Okay, so there's a lot of um, a lot of sort of talk by the students initially about the self-paced. Um, now there is more to that video, and if you're interested, um, there'll be a link in the uh, notes later on that you can come and have a look at. But um, I went through and I sort of summarised the rest of the the content in the video. So the fact that um, it's self-paced. The fact that there's unlimited retakes is the next thing the students talk about. So this idea that students are able to take an assessment piece and sort of retake that as many times as they need to, um, which is, a, again, a pretty um, out there idea. But that's a, a big sort of part of mastery learning is that students can keep on going until they've actually mastered the content. Uh, flipped videos is another thing that the students bring up and uh, this is becoming more and more common in this day and age and again I think um, the COVID school closures and things have sort of spurred this on a little bit but uh, the use of videos and sort of organizing a library of content for students to be able to access at any time um, students like that and the fact that there's work portfolios so students appreciated that all of their work and all the evidence that they've mastered concepts were all kept sort of centrally and that they were able to review that at any time and, and they really appreciated that sort of idea. Um, some challenges that interestingly, although self-paced was one of the strong advantages, um, students also sort of said that self-paced nature of the course was a bit of a challenge. Um, obviously students are, have to take more ownership of their learning, they need to stay on pace, they have to have time management. And then as suggestions, students were saying that they would like to have more group class discussion activities. And so they were proposing that at the end of a particular unit or at the start of a unit, that they had an opportunity to all come together. Um, so I think that there's definitely, I, I think the risk of mastery learning could be that we, we think that every student is an island. And that's certainly not what we're trying to um, suggest is, is a good way to go. Uh, I think that the, the opposite of that can be true, that with mastery learning, we would hope that students would actually be using each other as, as support and, um, and leaning on each other's understanding as well. So um, yeah, so that's sort of what the students came up with. So I'm going to make you type some more stuff in the chat again. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in what sort of things come to your mind. So what are some immediate benefits from what you've seen and what you now sort of we're talking about mastery learning? What are some immediate benefits that you can see from this sort of an approach? And what are some immediate challenges that you see as well? If you could um, type something in the chat for me on those two questions, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, as you're typing, I'll, I'll, um, I'll sort of talk a little bit further as well. I 
reached out to a number of teachers recently that are using a bit of a mastery approach. It is being done to some extent in some schools, um, more commonly in the middle school. And there's certain products out there that sort of support it. And um, yeah, some, some uh, answers that they gave were very interesting, which I'd love to share and see if they're in line with your thoughts. Um, we've got benefits. Students feel like they're able to learn at a pace that works for them. Um, absolutely. Um, this personalized learning, which is great. Uh, yeah, big challenge is the fact that we've got some, uh, the idea of asynchronous learning here. Um, build students confidence to move on. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about this idea that students are actually going to really understand a concept before they build on with the next topic, which I think in mathematics is, is super important um, out of all the subjects, that's for sure. Um, some other things that I heard from teachers that I reached out to is um, that it increases engagement for students. They're able to work at the level of maths that they understand. So that means that um, students like or coming to maths because they can do the work. Um, the ownership and independence is part of that increased engagement as well. They, they enjoy that independence. This is something that I've heard from teachers. Um, the, one of the big challenges that I have heard from other teachers is uh, the feedback requirements and the time to complete. Obviously, um, this sort of a system requires a lot of feedback for the students. And if each student is working on a different task at a different time, or at the same time, uh, that's feedback across a, a variety of different things that you're trying to provide to them. And uh, obviously, in, in line with that idea that students need to stay on pace, if students do fall behind, it can be sort of a challenge to get them to catch up to the level that they're supposed to be. Um, yeah, so and that's sort of in line with, um, with something in the chat, ensuring students are ready to move on by the timeframes required for syllabus completion, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we've also got keeping disengaged students on task is difficult um, and the classroom culture. Yeah, cool. So there's definitely some advantages. There's definitely some challenges. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, here's another video. This is again uh, a video from a teacher this time in, in America that's using it. This is a very, very short one. And um, I, I'll, I'll play this. And there's a reason that I, I thought that this was worth sharing as well. So let's have a quick look. Mastery learning has been extremely crucial for my kids this year because for them, it's taken the phrase, I don't get it, and it's turned into the phrase, I don't get it yet. They know that they have the freedom at the end of the day to grapple with something that they may not understand at first until they do understand. And for me, that's been important because it gives me assurance that I'm not creating holes and that they do have a deeper understanding of their content. For them, it gives them empowerment. Um, I've seen that they take ownership of their learning because they know even if at first they're really struggling, they will be given the time to work on it until they truly understand. And all of the hard work that they're putting in will pay off in the end. So that's been super important for my kids this year. Okay, so I, something that I really loved about that video, um, and yeah, we will share these these later on if, if there was any issues with that. Um, she mentioned that it's changed the students' perspectives from I can't do this to I can't do this yet. And I think that that's sort of really where the power of this approach lies. So regardless of some of the challenges, um, which, you know, obviously need to be addressed, and I hope that in some of the strategies that I'm going to look at that we can sort of deal with some of those challenges as well, uh, I think that it's really worth looking at this just from the perspective of, of mindset and the concept that students have so much to learn from this beyond just the curriculum that we're teaching them. Uh, this, is, this is really coming down to fundamentally how people can be successful at, um, at anything they choose to do. And, um, you know, Carol Dweck has talked about the power of yet and, uh, and that sort of concept is, is quite a big idea. Um, and I think mastery learning really leans into that um, idea so I think that's really cool and something that I'm really excited about. So um, I've come up with a, a sort of a, a, a diagram here to 
summarize the key elements of mastery learning. So, um, you know, these, these elements are in research that I didn't come up with all these elements completely myself, um, but I have made this diagram and intentionally placed it inside um, the bubble of growth mindset, uh, because I think that that's really important. I think personally from the research that I've done and, and I've read quite a few papers in the last sort of month or so on this, and I've written a couple of short articles myself um, just on, on social media. And, uh, and something that, keep, that I keep coming back to is this belief that the mindset is really the key piece of this whole thing. And, and I think the reason that mastery learning hasn't been um, taken on board more is, is that mindset around it. And so the key elements that we do need to look at within the mindset is um, mastery learning has to have clearly defined goals. You have to be really clear on, on what the goals are for the students and they need to know them, uh, which is something again, that is, is pretty common uh, now in, in education. We do our learning goals and success criteria quite regularly, um, but they need to be really clearly defined and even to the extent where we've got different levels. Uh, so I'm about to go through that idea. Um, we also need continuous data. We need meaningful formative assessment that's um, always coming in and guiding us as teachers and also guiding the students as to what level of mastery are they currently at and what is the next steps that they need. Uh, where am I now? Where do I need to go and how, do, how am I going to get there? Um, so that, that data is really important in identifying those things. Uh, and importantly, we obviously need to provide opportunities for students to pursue uh, those goals, once they've worked out where they are and where they need to be, they need to have the opportunity to get there. Uh, so I'm going to break this into sort of two sections. I'm going to look at the clearly defined goals first, and then I'm going to look at continuous data and opportunities to pursue um, together, because I think that they can be linked quite nicely. Um, so let's have a look at clearly defined goals. Now, in my, um, a couple of years ago in, in 2019 in, in my school, we had a, um, a core PD session where we were focusing on proficiency scales. So I'm not sure if this is familiar to anyone that's with us today, um, but the idea of proficiency scales was basically framed as a method of clearly articulating goals on a scale for students such that they could engage with content at the appropriate level and track their progress towards effectively mastery. Um, so it made so much sense to me as a more robust method of having students engage directly with the learning intention. It also provided meaningful feedback to the teacher with regards to the planning of learning activities. And so, you know, you could ask, do these students require direct instruction? Do they require deepening of knowledge through practice? Do they need opportunities for knowledge application? Um, really keying in with that idea for the students of what do I know? What do I need to know? What do I do next as well? And so uh, there's some tips from Dr. Mazzano on these. He's, he's a big player in, in the development of proficiency scales. Uh, but basically the structure that I was sort of taught during that PD session was to have four levels. And this is arbitrary. Um, you could use as many levels and, and you could change this. I, I don't see why it has to be four, um, but there is some sense in it. So basically score three was curriculum standard. Um, score four was going above and beyond the curriculum standard. Score two is the prerequisites. And score one, I guess, is just there to, uh, for students that are not yet achieving even at a score two level. Um, so if they can achieve score two with help, it's sort of a starting point for them. Um, so I wanted to show you a, a quick little application of this. So say we were looking at fractions in decimals in year six, for example. So this is our curriculum um, objective. And so that would basically mean, okay, what are the prerequisites for being able to do addition and subtraction of fractions? Um, well, I'd need to understand what the numerator and denominator is. I, I might have some vocab words in there that students should understand. I might want to sort of make sure they can do basic skills of, of addition. Um, that, that would sort of be prerequisites and there could be other things. Um, that skill at level would be you know, adding fractions with the same denominator um, or related denominators. So the one on three plus five on nine, that's related. I can multiply one on three, multiply top and bottom of three and so on. Um, so there'd be some examples of that. And then there might be something a little bit more advanced, maybe some mixed numbers, maybe the denominators aren't directly related. And so it's applying the skills that students have hopefully understood from score 3.0 and taking it a little bit further. 
Um, so that's sort of the basic idea of proficiency scales, which again, I found really useful. So I implemented this with my year 10 students and I've got an, a quick example to share with you. Um, this, is, this is what it looked like. So at a year 10 level, um, it was very text heavy. And I basically had the students engaging with this directly on OneNote. Uh, they were highlighting questions as they did them. So what they really appreciated, and, and this is where the examples are so important to actually provide to the students. Um, so in that last table, having those examples of you know, types of problems that students would be looking for, that helps them anchor the concepts of, of what level they're at with what skill they're directly applying in, in, the, um, in the problems. And so I did it this way. I, I decided to include exercise 3H, for example, questions nine to 16 and so on. I listed the questions that were at that skill. So these questions um, at score 4.0 were obviously beyond the curriculum objectives um, that are listed at the top. Um, score 3.0, this was just directly um, tied in from those curriculum objectives. And it was linked with the textbook resource that we were using at the time. And so within that, I had evidence and I just had the students going through and highlighting questions as they were able to do it. And then wherever they got up to with their highlighting, that was the level that they were at. Um, going a bit further down, I had score 2.0 as well. And this is where I had the opportunity to put in terminology, basic processes, and uh, link to some earlier chapters in the textbook as well. And so, yeah, students were just able to go through and engage with this directly, highlight the skills that they could do. And I started to see, uh, even though I wasn't running a, a mastery classroom as such, I started to see some students really take that on. And I had students, for example, that were saying to me, sir, I'm, I'm not going to you know, participate so much in the lesson today. This is where I'm currently at in my proficiency scales and I want to just work on the next thing that I've got to do. And I would say, that's fine. That's great. Like if you want to continue on with that, that's okay. I'm going to be doing a lesson on, you know, where we're currently up to in the content, which is exercise 8F or something like that. Uh, but if you're happy moving through, I'll come and check on you once I've delivered the lesson. Um, and I was sort of doing this as an experiment because, you know, obviously, I wasn't recording the lessons I was delivering. And so part of me was thinking, okay, are the students gonna be able to catch up? But some students really liked that independent working. And so it gave them an opportunity to work out where am I at? Where do I go next? And I even intentionally put um, the where to from here down the bottom of the proficiency scales to try and get students to think about once as they were filling it in, what is the next step that they're gonna do? Um, they find it really useful. Uh, and in fact, I asked them, and these were some of the comments. I said, what is the most useful feature of the proficiency scales that were used? And uh, some com comments were a clear list of skills required, clearly articulated vocabulary was useful. The questions um, listed for them was obviously helpful as well. And then um, this was a real test, as I said, in your own words, what is the purpose of proficiency scales? I know that it works when I get some answers that are at least on the right track from the year 10 students. Um, and yeah, they said things like let students find the area that they fall into uh, within a section and indicates what level we should be up to. And another student, the purpose of the scales was to know how well you're doing and what questions you need to do. And so this provided a lot of um, assistance for these students uh, and I highly recommend if you haven't looked into proficiency scales, I think it's a well worth um, activity worth you know, looking into. Um, the, the one downside of the proficiency scales, I would say, is, is monitoring, again, that data and getting that data in and sort of keeping track myself. Um, I mostly sort of put that in the hands of the students, but it would have been nice if I'd had an easy way to see exactly where students were up to in terms of what they'd highlighted and what they were working on. And so this is where, and, and this, you know, obviously now I work for Mass Space as well, this is where technology can come in. And, and really help. So um, MathSpace has been sort of focused on mastery learning since its inception. Um, it has a really good depth and breadth of questions. And so I actually think that proficiency scales could be articulated for each topic within the mastery framework in MathSpace. And it could, a tech could be used essentially as a substitute for lists of questions that I was providing and uh, students can progress through. So this would be a pretty close match um, to, to what what I was doing and, and essentially students would be doing each topic and within each topic, they're sort of able to progress to a level of mastery and it actually uses that language for them that they've mastered the topic and, and so on. Um, so this is the student mastery report, but where it really gets interesting 
Um, and this is what I would have loved to have when I was doing um, proficiency scales in a sense is the teacher reporting. So the teacher reporting actually gives you a really clear track of exactly which subtopics have been mastered by which by each student. You can see there that mastered is the darkest color, um, developing is a lighter shade, and you've also got consolidating and proficient. So it, it sort of roughly lines up with the score one, two, three, four idea. Um, it's, not, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation, I would say, but there is some similarities and it flags when students need assistance as well. So this is sort of like the students doing that job of highlighting, but of course that's being captured digitally. Um, so I think that that's sort of really worth investigating and obviously it lays it out really nicely. Um, so that sort of leads into this idea of continuous data and, and I've got some other strategies to, to look at and explore here. We need continuous data and we need opportunities to pursue. Um, so just having the goals themselves and, and just linking it to mastery and mass base, I, anything like that, I don't think is enough. Um, I think if we, you know, obviously if we wanna go full mastery, we need to be doing a little bit more than just that. So there's a method called the grid method. You can look this up. Um, it's being used by a number of schools in America again at the moment. Um, this is basically a method of organizing a unit of work so that students can go through and, and basically do this independently. Um, it's, similar, it's got similarities with proficiency scales, but it's sort of amped up a bit. So this is the start of what a grid would look like. Um, basically, this is an opportunity for students to go through and fill out key vocabulary terms. Uh, it's linked, this, this particular example is to do with sample spaces. Um, from the Australian curriculum. And so students would start by having a look at each of these words and filling in a, a little definition for themselves as sort of that foundational knowledge. But where it gets really interesting is um, underneath that, we've sort of got this table. So the grid method defines different levels, again, sort of similar to the idea of proficiency scales, um, but it's different levels of depth of, of knowledge. So we've got define and recall at the bottom. And so students can start on the left-hand sort of column, and they basically progress through to the right-hand side. And at the end of it, you know, the third column there um, would be a, a sort of little assessment that would assess whether they have reached mastery of that particular skill or that particular level. Um, now, as you can see, there's actually assessment through this whole thing. So, so students would start by saying, okay, Kahoot Cohab uh, vocab review. I think I'm pretty good with my vocab. I'm just going to jump in and do that straight away. Um, or, you know, I'm just going to sort of skip some of the, the other stuff. And the students get to choose at what level they want to enter. But then if they don't succeed, they get to try again. And they would go back and they would do some of those earlier activities and progress towards mastery. And so this allows students freedom. It certainly allows them the opportunity uh, and it's giving you continuous data in the sense that built into it, you've got all those different assessments. And so students are constantly doing, you know, it's continuous assessment, a form of continuous assessment, and that data is coming in and uh, informing the next steps for the students and also allowing the teacher to um, scaffold appropriately and, and sort of assist where, where required. So a, a method like this, I think, um, takes a lot of time to set up. But this is sort of the full scope of what mastery learning would be in terms of really having um, clear, detailed steps for the students to follow and work out where are they, where do I need to go next, how do I get there? And that's basically what it comes back to. Um, moving up to the very top level of level four, you know, as you can see, that's above the sort of key assessment where there's a final score. Um, that's sort of going even deeper. And so it's an opportunity for students to really dig deep into the content um, at, at you know, the level that they choose. So it's a, it's a really cool idea. Um, again, there's a lot of work in setting something like this up. Something that I'm really excited um, about here at MassSpace uh, is the assessment, continuous assessment idea has been taken and really simplified um, it's been turned into something at Mass Space where students are able to do a quick five check-in sort of you know, once, twice a week. And this idea that continuous data can come in, students can work out exactly where they're at in terms of a pro progression. And then there's a step that they can do next. So I'd love to show you really quickly um, 
how this looks in mass space. We've got this new concept for waypoints. And so within waypoints, uh, students doing this continuous assessment get a skills report that shows exactly where they have achieved outcomes and where they haven't yet. And so each of those boxes, as you can see, highlighted a couple of times there, um, refers to a different curriculum outcome. And you can see that there's a progression again of sort of level one, two, three, four. Uh, they haven't answered questions on that yet. They sometimes, they often, they consistently. Now, all of these questions are going to be sort of the basic um, knowledge and understanding. We're not talking here about going into higher uh, depths of knowledge with this particular tool, but it's really a starting point. So if students are a grey box and they haven't answered any questions correctly on that yet at all, they're sort of down at the bottom level and they really need to, to access content at that level. Uh, if they're green, that means that they would be ready to probably go into the next level of depths of knowledge. So it's more granular, um, but where it gets really exciting is once students expand a particular skill and they can see the level of growth that they need to get to, those little mass space icons, this is the, the part where students go, well, where do I go next or what do I do next? And they can actually click on that and it takes them into the mass space workbook. Here they can access hints, they can access step-by-step -step support, they can skip steps if they're still unsure, and then the hints will change. And so as a learning resource, um, I think this is really powerful. So I love this idea that students can identify where they are at, whether you're doing that by a grid method or by other forms of continuous assessment, um, the ability for students to identify where they're at, work out what do I know, what do I need to know, and how do I get there? If we can do those three steps, I think we've got a really good sort of system in place. Um, now, there's some practical applications of this. This is a resource that I found. It's, it's actually from 2015. Uh, and it's a, it's a blog, it says self-paced learning, how one teacher does it. It's from a website called Cult of Pedagogy. And I just thought that this was brilliant. Um, basically they had a, a unit plan, not as comprehensive as the grid method, but a similar idea. Um, basically they would create an assessment. And so obviously step one, select a unit of content. They would create an assessment that was sort of a pretest. And on that pretest, each question would be allocated to a specific outcome, similar to the way that waypoints would work. And so depending on whether a student was able to answer each question correctly or not, sort of defined what their next steps would be. So on that table there, you can see, and, and this is available, you can actually download a copy of this um, at the website. And so I encourage you to sort of have a little explore and look around. Um, but what you can see there is pre-test question two. So if a student could not do question two, for example, then they would progress into that particular lesson, lesson 2.4. Um, they would practice skills practice 2.4. So this is just aligned with the, the textbook resource that this teacher was using. Uh, and they would do that particular ass assessment of assignment 2.4 on page 38. Um, based on their mastery level of that, they would mark that out, whether how successful they were at, that, um, at those resources at the assignment, and then they'd progress on. Um, so obviously if they if there were multiple questions they couldn't do, they would find each of those. And that's sort of the column that they're working at. If they could do it, then the assumption is that they, um, they've already mastered that particular thing. So yeah, so you create the assessment, you create a chapter guide like this, um, you give that pretest, and then it's just about helping students to identify which standard do I need to master, providing the time for, for that to happen. And then obviously iterate on that um, is the last step that they suggest there. Um, Something that I loved about this particular resource is, you know, there, there's this question of what if students are not motivated? Um, and the response from the teacher is not all students get to do the self-paced. Some have to work with her in a more traditional teacher-led setup. So basically um, students, it, this is sort of a privilege being able to do this. So it's all set up, it's ready to go. And the students, would exhibit quite a bit of desire to want to, to do it this way. Uh, that autonomy, that ability for them to choose um, increases their ownership of the learning and, and engagement in, in a large sense. And so if students weren't producing output, if they weren't working, then that, at that point, the teacher would say, well, you've, you've got to come back in to um, sit with me for the main lesson. And so there's sort of this teacher in, in this particular case was running lessons for a small group and as, they, as the students were able to show 
uh, some more independence, they would go off and they could do this other mastery approach. And obviously the lesson that was being run would take the entire um, curriculum time and the teacher would have an opportunity to go and, and see how the students were going. So I love that idea um, that, that you can do a bit of both as well. Um, now, in terms of monitoring and how do you monitor a classroom where you've got students doing all different things, you've got this group over here doing this topic, this group over here doing this topic, or, you know, each student is doing like a different row entirely. Um, how do you manage that? And that was something that I always sort of thought, okay, that, that's going to be the difficult bit um, of this whole thing. So, again, I, I'd like to sort of go to the concept of technology because there's something that's really, really cool um, that certainly within math space, and there's probably other um, technical sort of platforms that could do something similar, but um, the way that math space does it, I think is brilliant. So within math space, there's something called an activity report. As you can see, it, it can be put on live mode. And the best thing about this, if you have a look down the bottom, you'll see that I've got four students listed there. Uh, three of them are working on something. Now, each of them are working on a completely different topic. Um, these are different topics that students have chosen based on their waypoints report and they've clicked through and they're doing their work in math space um, based on what waypoints identified. And I can see um, that the top student there is, has done the most amount of work recently, um, but I can also see that that top student needs some form of assistance. There's a little highlight for that for me. So um, they've got nine questions wrong at the moment. So what I can then do is I can click into that, that questions um, just on that little icon on the right hand side and it will actually show me that workspace for that exact set of questions that the student's working on so I can see all these questions that the student's gotten wrong I can see exactly what they've done okay they just haven't um, they haven't shifted the decimal place in the right direction in terms of the power that they've used I can see where they've asked for hints and all that sort of stuff so I can review that work uh, so this allows me to have students each working on their own individual thing while I'm still monitoring and providing assistance at the point that I need to, um, which I think is super exciting. And, and I think is something that uh, we, I, I mean, I haven't seen any practical way of doing that to that degree um, before now. And so I'm really excited about that idea. Um, so it sort of comes to this idea that we're working in the constraints of our current education system. We've, we have to sort of meet certain timelines. We have to, um, report on things a certain way. We've got a, a assessment and stuff that we need to do. Um, I'm very much of the view of, of why, why not both? Why can't we take the best of mastery learning, the best sort of concepts and ideas and elements and apply that in our standard classroom setting? Um, that's something that I'm really excited about. And so coming back to the core elements of, of mastery learning um, and the key principles, if you like, um, again, I think the mindset is super important. Uh, we need to have a growth mindset and we need to foster a growth mindset in our students in terms of how they approach this. Because if students um, want to grasp this and they, they want to be self-directed, they're going to need to sort of be willing to fail at things and willing to come back and try it again if they didn't succeed the first time. Um, and that's a fundamental sort of principle. Um, I think we need to provide opportunities for student agency. We need to allow students to be able to choose which thing that they're going to work on next based on their diagnosis of, of where they're up to and, and identifying obviously first what, what they need to do and then having some choice there. Um, obviously, as I said, they need to encourage, learn from their mistakes. We need to encourage that if students get something wrong, it's that idea of I can't do it yet that is so, so important. Um, I think we need to definitely allow time for constructive feedback and having personal improvement with that. And so that sort of immediate feedback that can be supported with something like technology, um, but just allowing you know, the teacher having that role of, of being a, almost a coach and sort of giving feedback to the students on how their growth is going and, and where they're up to. Um, and this is so important. We need to stop students comparing themselves with other students, um, which is a big hallmark of performance oriented learning. Um, you know, the students that would always ask me for the exam results and they just look at the, the letter associated with uh, that particular assessment item. They, I've got a B, okay, great, and move on and not even look at the rest of it. Um, that's, that's really coming down to comparing uh, with other students and sort of you got a B, I got a B plus, 
you got to see, you know, this sort of comparison is, I don't believe it's healthy. Um, I think what we need to do is focus on students comparing what, how, how have they grown and where are they up to. Um, and finally, we need to support a safe classroom community that promotes mastery orientation from teachers and students alike. Um, so the environment that we're in is super important. Um, now I'm very aware of, of time. We are running to the end of the session, um, but I did have a quick video. Um, this is only a short, short, short part of this whole video. It's, a, it's an author called Robert Green. Um, he has written a, a number of successful books and he's basically um, studied the psychology of many successful historical and contemporary figures as a part of the things that he's written. Uh, so as we think about education in the 21st century and the future that we're preparing our students for, I, I found his view on mastery in general to be particularly interesting. Um, he wrote a book called Mastery at the end of 2012. And so this is just a short uh, snippet from what he, from what he says. Um, and I'd like to sort of finish or conclude with, with this statement from him. The level of distraction is a negative. Let's face it, it is a negative. It's, it makes it harder for us to go deeper and deeper into a subject or to focus deeply. But the good parts of our era is the incredible explosion of information, how much is accessible to us, how with just a couple of clicks on the internet, we can start investigating some new uh, science or some new discovery. It's just at our fingertips, it's, it's incredible. And so these are all people who are taking advantage of all of this and are making connections between ideas, between different fields. That's where the future of mastery is. Yoki Matsuoka, she goes into electrical engineering and then she goes into robotics. And now she's, uh, and she studied neuroscience. So she's combined them all into a new field called new robotics where she's trying to design products uh, that have uh, that are, operate like a robot, but are um, linked to how the human brain works, so that they're things that learn. She's combined five or six wow. different fields into this new field that she calls wow. new robotics. That's the future of mastery, but you have to master the basics of the whole thing, which is building discipline, being able to practice at something over a long period of time, and being able to focus nothing we ever invent is going to be able to change that. The level of discipline. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I like to finish with that just because as we think about what we're preparing our students for, and we, we don't know um, what jobs are going to be around and, and how the sort of the, the landscape will change um, in the future. We can, we can barely predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but I, I love his idea of, of sort of combining fields and this sort of idea of where mastery is heading. But it's really important that he said, you know, we've, we've got to get the discipline right. We've, we've got to understand the basic principles of mastery um, in order to progress on. And so, um, so yeah, with that in mind, um, I'd love to hear um, from you as we finish up. Um, so what do you wonder? What do you want to try? Um, if you could type some things in the chat of what you wonder and what you want to try um, from this session. I hope that you found that that really useful and some useful strategies there. And I hope that um, there's some things for you to go away and think about and uh, maybe try as well. So if you can uh, share with me what you wonder um, about mastery learning and what sort of things you might want to try, I'd love to hear from you. Um, we obviously have a continuation of this series in a couple of weeks. And so if you want to know more about mindset, uh, that will be what the next session is on. I think it's really worthwhile considering that um, and the general mindset approach. So um, please join us for that. And again, I, I hope that you've enjoyed this session. Yeah, awesome. More pretesting, reusing of the pretest again mid topic. That's awesome. I think that regular data collection is so important um, in terms of, yeah, it's formative assessment is such a key component. Um, and you know, like I said, it's something that Benjamin Bloom was a big proponent of. Um, how much time and energy is required to implement a mastery classroom? I think that that is a big question. And I think that, uh, essentially this is sort of a natural progression from people that have tried something like flipped learning and that sort of thing this is typically the next step and 
it takes time to get the resources together. I, I won't deny that. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, that is a really good question. How much mastery orientation will become the new syllabus structure and, and how much will sort of go down that direction? Um, I'm interested, I, I hope in some ways it does. Um, I know that the primary school that my, my kids go to uh, are currently looking at multi-aged um, classrooms as, as a standard thing. So they have a one, two class, a three, four class and a five, six class to allow um, more opportunity for students to get content at the level that they're, they're at. Um, so I'm excited about that idea and I, I hope that it catches on. Um, thanks so much for joining me, everyone. Do you want to conclude with anything, Erin? No, you can finish off there. I was on to different questions, but we can save it for another time because I know we're out of time now. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, um, I hope everyone enjoys the afternoon. And um, yeah. Have a great have a great time. Make sure that you um, jump onto our social media as well, and I'd love to continue the discussion with you there. Uh, I will just point out, sorry, just one last thing that there will be um, all the content available um, on the course that you've signed up through, uh, so you should be able to access that as well as a few reflection pieces for your own professional learning there. <laughs>